Okay, let's start the second part of lecture number five. If the first part was pretty good for you, that bodes well, then the rest of this should go pretty smooth because we're all at least going to be building on that logic. But we're going to do a couple other sort of variations of what we've been doing. So now we're going to do what's called a proportion. And so we're going to say a proportion between two z-scores. So we were doing percentile, which is all the scores, the percent of scores below a certain score. But we're going to do something that's we're going to chop up parts of the standard normal distribution, and we're going to look at proportion between two scores. So it doesn't really matter where the scores are, but if we say there's a Z score over here, and we have a Z score over here, when we say proportion between, we're talking about what percent of people are in this area. I think I'm going to redraw that. So I think I want to show you the logic of this whole, whole thing. It doesn't really matter where the Z scores are, whether they're above or below the mean. It doesn't really matter. So we have a Z score here. We have a Z score here. And again, we want to find the area in between these two. And we're going to have some specific numbers, so we're going to do the logic there. But what the logic that we're going to use is it's pretty simple. We're going to take the percentile for the one that's the most farthest on the right, and this will have the highest percentile, right? So let's just, we're going to make this up. Let's say that it's at the 60th percentile. Then we're going to take the percentile for the z-score that's furthest on the left, and we're going to find that. And in this case, we'll just make up a number. Let's just pretend it's 30. We don't know, but this is just to illustrate it. So this z-score has a, a 60th percentile, so 60% of the scores go from that score to all the way to the end. Remember, this is what our table tells us. And then these, this z-score that's further along on the left so it's a lower z-score, at least in terms of being towards the lower end of the scale. We can find the percentile from the table. So guess what? Oops, sorry about that. My laptop, if you lean on it, it will move this stuff. So if you take this area, this percentile for the one that's most on the right, you minus the percentile for the one that's closest to the left, guess what's left over? This area right here, and that's what you're trying to find. So if we had these two numbers as a, the percent below, there should be 30% in the shaded area. Because this, remember this line here, goes all the way to the end, this is 60. This line here goes all the way at the end is 30. So we take this line minus this line, what's left over, this area right here that we're trying to find. So that's the logic. The logic is actually quite simple. All we have to do is find two percentiles. I should say percents in this case. This is actually a proportion. So these two proportions, we've been talking about percentiles, but those two proportions to the end and then subtract them. So this is the logic. It's relatively easy. We're just going to do it before twice. We're going to do it twice, and then we're going to numbers, and we're going to subtract them to get our final answer. So while we're doing something that seems more complicated, we're actually just using our logic we've been using before, and it's relatively easy. Okay, so let's look at this example. So we have a sample with a mean of 222. We have a standard deviation of 24. And it's asking what the proportion of scores are. So proportion, remember, we don't move the decimal place. The tables have proportions. 
So what's the proportion of scores between 190 and 235? So there's two scores there. And one's above the mean. 235 is above the mean of 222, and one's below the mean. So I'm going to draw this real quickly, because that's always our first step. It's to draw it. It helps you show your logic. It also will help you solve the problem. I'm going to draw this up here a bit. So here's our stuff. Here's the mean. So the mean is here, and the mean is, if I remember, yes, it is 222. Two, two. And we have a Z, or I'm sorry, a score of 235. So we know it's above the mean. We're not quite sure how far it is. The standard deviation is 24, so it's really only 13 points above the mean. So it's less. It's like about a little bit more than half of a standard deviation away. So 235. So we don't really care exactly if this is exact, but there's a score of 235 here. And we have a score of 190. So 190 is 32 points below the mean. So it's, it's more than a standard deviation below the mean. So it's probably down here a little bit. That's 190. And the question is asking us, what is the proportion of scores here in the shaded area between these two scores? So remember that our logic is we're going to find the proportion. The table will give us this for the score that's farthest on the right. And then we're going to find it for the score that's farthest on the left. We're going to take that score, this big area, subtract this area, and that leaves us with this area that we're trying to find. So relatively simple logic. So we actually are going to do this in uh, two steps. The first step is we're going to have to find the z-scores. So what's the z-score for 235 and what's the z-score for 190? Because that will tell us the proportions on the table. I think I might have this in the slides. Let's check. And I do. So the 190. So if we take 190 minus 222, that was the mean. That's negative 32. And we divide it by 24. 24 is the standard deviation. So the z-score for the 190 is negative 1.33. So these are our z-scores right here. Negative 1.33. And that makes some sense. So if we look at our diagram, it kind of came out what we sort of thought about. Then for 235, so we take 235 minus the mean of 222. We have to standardize it with the standard deviation, 24. So we have 13 divided by 24. The z-score for 235 is 0.54. So we go over here. The z-score is a positive 0.54. Now it's really simple. Now all we do is go to the table and find the proportion of people who are below the z-score of 0.54, the table will tell us that right away. Then we'll have to go to the negative z table and look up 1.33 and find the proportion of scores below that. And then we'll take that minus that, and that will be our answer. So let's do the 0.54 first. So 0.54, are we in the right place? No. Those numbers are below 50, and it's a negative one. So 0.54 is positive. So we're going to look for the 0.54 and the number below it. That's what our table tells us. So let me snip this. It says we already have something. Ooh, I like this thing. So let me save it. Maybe I'll put it into my stats lecture stuff. I don't want that.
Okay. So I'm going to snip this. I don't know if I'm going to go back to that. Let's see. <laughs> and so I didn't I didn't account for having two snippets. So before we get too distracted, let's get going on this. I'm going to snip the table. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So remember that it was 0.54. And actually, the numbers are there too. So I'll just use what's typed there. So 0.54. So 0 0.54, 0 0.5, 4 is the second decimal. So it's over here. So 0.54. Right here, so that's our proportion. So we're sticking with proportions. We're not going to move the decimal. It said proportion. So 0 0.70540. And I rounded off to the fourth decimal place. So we see right here. I have it right here. So 0.54 to the left end is 0 0.7054. Correct? 0 0.7054. So now we just have to find, so that's the one on the right, down. Now we have to find the one that's furthest on the left, down. So we know that this is 0.754. Once we find this one, we subtract the two. It gives us this area right here that we're trying to find. Okay, so our negative z-score in this case, the one the most on the left, that's farthest along on the left, of our distribution is negative 1.33. So let's go ahead and go to this one. And we're not in the right spot, right? Because there's things above 50 here. And it doesn't look like this is a negative z-score. This is positive. So make sure you go to the negative z-score, negative 1.33. I'm going to snip this. And I'm going to make it bigger, not that big. So remember, negative 1.3 is how it starts, negative 1.33. Second decimal voice is here. So go down here, go to this column. And so the proportion of scores below negative 1.33 z-score is 0 0.09176. I think I may have rounded that up to 0 0.0918. And I indeed did. See, I just plug it in there. So remember, all you do is you take the bigger one, the one that's furthest on the right, subtract the smaller one, the one that's furthest on the left, take those two, subtract, so 0.6136% of scores are between those two numbers. So 61%, more than 61% of the scores are between the score of 190 and 235 in that distribution. So that shaded area in between those two scores is this. So hopefully that made some sense. So the logic, again, is to find the one on the right. Actually, let's go through the steps. So you take the raw scores. There's two raw scores. You have to convert each raw score into a z-score. You take the z-score that's furthest on the right. You find the proportion from the right, this right score, to the left end of the distribution. Then you take the score that's furthest on the left, you find a proportion from that score all the way down to the end of the distribution, which the table gives you. You have these two numbers. You take the larger one, subtract the smaller one. You're going to get the proportion between the two scores. Just a note of logic, you cannot have a negative proportion. So if you find yourself making a mistake here and getting a negative proportion, you know that you just made a mistake and just flip your numbers and get a positive proportion. So the proportion has to be above a zero, essentially, unless you have the same score. I'm not going to give you the same score. That would be really easy to 
the proportion of scores between the same scores is zero. So it's got to be a positive number, so no negative numbers. And for proportions, the number has to be below a one. So proportion is below one. Percentages are below 100. So here's an example. I want to make sure I didn't skip anything. So I want you to solve this. So we have a distribution. This is actually a Wechsler intelligence scale distribution. We have a distribution with a mean of 100. We have a standard deviation of 15. We have one score that's 87. The second score that's 110. And we're asking what's the proportion of scores between these two scores. So I suggest that you draw this first, then remember the steps. You have two different scores. For each score, convert it to a z-score. For each of your z-score, goes to the table. Find a number on the table. Subtract the two scores. Make sure it's a positive number. That's your answer. So go ahead and do this, and we will solve it together. Okay, you should have solved it. And so I'm going to draw it real quickly. I have to get rid of this. I can't have two drawings at once. That would be nice. But that's fine. So we have a distribution. Our mean is 100. Oops, I don't want it there, actually. Sorry about that. I don't want to erase everything. I just want to erase this a little bit. So our mean is 100, and we have a score of 87. So that's 13 below the mean. That's almost one standard deviation below the mean. So 87, probably down here somewhere. So we have 87, and we have a score of 110. So uh, 10 points, about two-thirds of a standard deviation above the mean. So 110, maybe something like this. And so remember to shade in the area that you're trying to find. Looks like a Picasso drawing for a second there. And so the logic again is to find the z-score for both of these things and then find the number on the table for the one furthest on the right, right? And then find the number on the table for the one furthest on the left. Subtract those two numbers and you're gonna come up with this area in between, them to, between those two scores. So the first thing we have to do is we have to convert these two z-scores and I do not have it. I am gonna to have to calculate it, oh no. Uh, oh no, I have to actually have to lose this. So I don't have to lose this. I can do it. So we have 87. I'll write it over here. I'm going to do one. Well, I'll do 110 first. Sorry about that. So we have 110. I made a mistake, but it's a great one to correct. 110 over minus 100. That's the mean. We have a standard deviation of 15. So we have 10 fifteenths. So two thirds. So the z-score here is, the z is, this is, you know, I'm not modeling, I guess. So make sure to have the formula. And so we're going to have a z that's 0.67 above the mean. So we have 0.67 above the mean. And it's just late enough, and I'm just uh, obsess obsessive enough to do this. Yeah. So we have to go to the table and find this, pro this proportion below that. So these are our Zs on this line. And then we have the same formula. And we're going to take 87. You can, do, you can put the formula once per problem. So we have the score of 87, subtract the mean, so the distance from the mean, but that doesn't make 
any sense unless we can standardize it with the standard deviation. So it's a negative, don't forget the negative. So we have 13 up here, correct? Over 15. So we have a negative z-score of 13 divided by 15. 13 divided by 15, 0.87. 0.87, okay, so 0.67 and 0.87, and I'm going to write that 0.67 so I don't forget, and then negative 0.87, was that negative, that's supposed to be negative 0.87, correct, where's my stuff, yep, 0.67, negative 0.87, which is kind of weird. That's just a coincidence. Don't think that there's something that you can do that every time you have that, it's going to happen. Nope. Paranoid enough to do this. Yep. <laughs> Tuck my way out of that a little bit. So we have 0.67. So 0.67, we have to go to the table. We'll see here that the numbers are lower than 50, so we want the positive Z, Z table. 0.67, let's sketch it out here. Our positive Z table, 0.67. So 0.6, 0.6, 0.6, 0.6. Point six seven. We go down here. And I'm okay if you want to round up to the fourth decimal, decimal place because proportions are given to the fourth decimal place. Percentiles and percents are to the second decimal place. Proportions go to the fourth. So here we have seven four eight six. So we go to our table, and this is. 7486, correct? 7486. Then we have negative 87. So we have to go to the negative Z table. Negative Z table below 50. And let me snip this. Here we go. So negative point eight seven. That's the seven. I kind of went over it. That's okay. And here we are. So the proportion from negative point eight seven to the end on the left is point one nine two two nineteen twenty two. So from the table, 1922, and you should be writing some of this like this. You should be showing your logic. That should be an arrow, but I'm not gonna worry about that. We subtract those two numbers. So 7486 minus 1922 equals, let me, I don't know why my calculator doesn't show up on the taskbar. Maybe I'm closing it, that's why. 0.7486 minus 0.1922. So 0.5564. That's your answer. There, in terms of proportion, there's 0.5564 proportion of scores. So 55.64% 55, 55 of the scores between those two Z scores and between these scores of 87 and 110. That's your answer. Hopefully that makes some sense. And I'm gonna leave this open. So hopefully that logic makes some sense. We're gonna do just uh, another couple here. Um, so some people use different strategies for when they're uh, split, one's above, one's below. And then when they're both on the same side, we are gonna use the same strategy because that same strategy works regardless of where the z-scores are. So I'm gonna get rid of this, oops.
This is not snipped. My snip is open with the table. So the strategy that we've been using works just as well regardless of where the scores are. And I might draw several of those things. So we already saw it works in a situation where they're split, one's above, one's below. Let's say that we have a situation where both are above. So there's a score here and there's a score here. They're both above the mean. We want to find that proportion. Our strategy still works. Find the proportion of scores that's below the z-score for this one on the right. Find the z-score for this one on the left. That's Go away all the end. That's what the table will give us. If we take this line minus this line, we'll come up with this. We'll come up with this area that we want to find. And again, I leaned on my laptop apparently and it's exploded. And so it works just as well for two things, two things, two scores above the mean, and it works just as well for two scores below the mean. Let's say there's a score here, there's a score here. We're going to find the z-score, and we're just going to find the z-score, and then the table will tell us the proportion below that z-score for the one on the right. Then we're going to find the proportion for the one on the left. And so we're going to have this number, and we're going to have this number from the table. We take x minus y, that's going to give us the z. It's going to tell us this area that we're trying to find. So our strategy that we've been using works just as well. So let's actually do one. And I'm going to, I'm going to skip the example I have. If you want another example, you can work through this example. But then just let's use this one. Just go ahead and do it. We're going to use the same logic, so there's nothing different. So here we have two scores below the mean. Again, you can go through that other example I just went through, but we already went through two examples. So let's just take one where they're uh, below the mean. I think that's sufficient. If you want to go through the other one, you can look at it. If you don't understand it, you can ask me about it, especially in a live Zoom session. So here's an example. We have the same thing. We have the Wexler intelligence scale, mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. Let's find the proportion of scores between 85 and 70. Both of these are below the mean. So it's good to draw it first. Once you've drawn it, then you can go ahead and do the stuff that we did before. And I'll review the answer. OK, so you should have solve this on your own and I'm going to do it with you now I'll do the answer and so you should draw it first you should draw it first it will show the logic and I want to make sure I want to remember what I did I think I actually did these in standard deviation units so we have a 70 and 85 this one should be pretty easy 70 and 85 I'm going to draw these things up here a bit Again, don't worry about your drawing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just showing the logic. This is the mean in the middle. The mean is 100. And we want to find the score between 85 and, or the proportion of scores between 85 and 70. So 85 is actually a standard deviation below the mean. 85. And then we have 70. So that's two standard deviations below the mean. So down here a bit more. And the question is asking us to find this proportion between these two scores. One thing we know right away in terms of logic is that it should be less than 50, right? If you have two scores and they're either on both on the positive side of the z-scores above the mean or they're both on the scores below the mean, we can see in our table right away that you better have a proportion that's less than 0 0.50. So here's where some logic comes in also is make sure that your answer makes some sense. And if you draw the diagram, it should help you see whether it makes sense or not. So we have these two scores, and we have to find the z-scores for these scores. So the z-score is always going to be the score 
minus the mean and that difference doesn't make any sense unless you divide it by the standard deviation that's a mean sorry about that that's the mean x bar i'm running out of space up there that's why it's looking a little bit weird so if we have 85 minus the mean with 100 we divide it by a standard deviation of 15. This is going to be negative. We were below the mean. Negative 15 divided by 15. So our z-score is actually negative 1. So let's list the z-scores on the second line. And it's negative 1.00. Then we have 70. This is a, the problem of using the Wexler scales as I start thinking of standard deviations, whole standard deviations. Divide by 15, so this is negative 30, divided by 15, so the z-score is negative 2. So the z-score for this is negative 2.00. And our logic is we're going to go to the table and find this number and then find this number and subtract the two and it will tell us this area right here and so i'm going to get rid of this thing so it's negative one and negative two so i'm going to write that down here negative one and negative two and let's go to the table and we can just stay with the negatives they're both negative, they're both below the mean, so we're going to use this table. So let's snip this. Ah, oh, crap. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to have to... Remember that first column is a, is a zero, and actually I think I can maybe just inch it. In. Nope. Stupid thing. I can enter it in there, it looks like. So let's snip this table. That's why so many of our problems don't go too far beyond two because it's hard to get it all in one little shot here. So remember the one that's, that's at negative one is the one that's most on the right. So I like to find that one first. So negative one, and remember it's negative 1.00 so here we have a number and it looks like it's 1587 so if we round up to four decimal places it's 1587 so this one is 1587 oops 1580 uh, yeah my num my numbers lacks go off 1587 and we have to do the same thing. We have to go to the table and find a number for negative 2. Whoops. Negative 2.00. And we'll do it just on the same one. So we have negative 2 here and then 0 .00. It's right here. We'll take this number. We'll round it up 0 0.0228. Round it up. So it's 0 0.0228. 0228. So we have 1587 minus 0228, and that's going to equal a number. I'm going to calculate 0.587 minus 0 0.028, 1359. So over 13% of the scores are between the score of 85 and 70 in that distribution. But you want to report it as a proportion. I ask for a proportion, so have your number be 0.1359. That should be pretty easy because we're using the same strategy that we used before. Oops, actually, I want it up because this will be very helpful. And so I'm going to clear this, and I'm going to take this off. 
And actually, some people might consider that the most difficult thing that we're going to do in these problems. So I think we have it down, I hope. If you have questions, come to a Zoom session. We can go over it. So the final thing that we're going to be doing in terms of calculations for this lecture is we're going to find a score at a percentile. So this is quite different. So if you remember that we were taking the scores and finding out percentiles and proportions, but now we're going to be asked, you know, I'm going to snip this. So if we know the distribution, if we know the mean and standard deviation, we can ask, well, what scores, for example, at the 28th percentile? So at what score did 28% of the people score below it? So if we know our mean and standard deviation, we can actually figure this out. And here's the formula. It's right there, down here in the bottom. And I'm going to actually copy this in a second. So the score, the score you're trying to find at that percentile is the, whoops, sorry about that. I leaned on my laptop, is the mean for the distribution plus the Z score for that percentile, which that's you're going to find in the table, and then the standard deviation, which you're given. So you're actually given the mean and the standard deviation. You actually have to find the z-score in the table. So I'm actually going in here. Yeah, I'll, I'll just solve this problem, so why not? This will be the example we're, we're going to be using is my snippet. So what score is there? So what score is at this percentile is the question. So remember that our formula is, well, to find that score, you take the mean and you're going to add the z-score for that percentile. So this is the thing that you have to solve. This is the only thing from the table. So you're going to go to the table and find this. You're going to go to the table and find this. You're given the mean. You're given that first part, and you're given the standard deviation. Right there. How I like to think about it, remember what the z, the z formula was. So remember the Z formula was this. Take the score minus the mean. Divide it by the standard deviation. So you're just going to make, essentially, I sometimes call it a sandwich. This is what you want. So this thing comes down. You're trying to find x. Well, What's the most important thing in terms of where the score is? The most important thing is where is it in relationship to the mean? So the mean says, I am really important. I'm coming first. And then, because the mean is so important, it says, stay away from me, everything else. The mean comes down here and it's by itself. What's left? Well, these two things are left. So the Z is left. And the S is left. And I call it also a sandwich because we know this, our given stuff, if I can write it properly. So in the problem, you're going to be given the mean. You're going to be given the standard deviation. This is the bread. I'm going to give you the bread. The only thing you're going to have to do is um, put the meat in or put the faux meat in if you are vegetarian or vegan. So you're given the mean. You're given a standard deviation. The mean so important, make sure to separate it. The only thing you have to find from the table is the Z. That's it. So that's one way to think about it is just you're solving for the X. The mean is the most important thing in relation to the X, so the mean has to be separated in the formula. And then you multiply those two other things, the Z and the S. Or think about it like a sandwich. You're given the mean, you're given the standard deviation, those are your pieces of bread. All you have to do is find in the table this Z score. And I'm actually just going to head, I'm going to go ahead and do this. There's probably another example on the PowerPoint, but who cares? You can use that for your own studying if you want to look at it. I'm not going to erase all the ink. I just want to get rid of, let's see how good this works. Not fantastic, but once you start something, you got to finish it sometimes. Here we go. 
So remember our question was, what scores at the 28th percentile? And I'm just gonna make up some numbers. So I, I don't really care. I'll make up some numbers. And so I'm gonna tell you that the mean is, let's just use a number that I don't give often, 55. Standard deviation is a seven. I just made those numbers out of the blue. And so one thing that you can do to practice your statistics is you can make things up if you want to. And if you have a partner in the class, you can uh, work together and see if you have the right solutions. So what's the score at the 28th percentile? The distribution has a mean of 55, standard deviation of seven. So you're given this, the mean, you're given the standard deviation, I give you the bread. So you want to put the formula, so the formula is here. All you do is you plug it in. So find that score. Well, what's the mean? The mean is 55. And it's plus. The Z is what you have to find from the table. And we'll do that in a second. Standard deviation is 7. So this is going to equal 55. And notice it's a negative z-score because it's below 50 percentile. So when we say plus, we're going to actually subtract from it. That makes some sense. If you're at the 28th percentile, you better be below, be below 55. So this is going to be a negative z-score. So 28th percentile, well, where is that? OK. Now I'm regretting doing this because I actually I need to go to the Z table. But hopefully you understand it and I don't have to sketch it anymore. So 28th percentile, where is that in this thing? So we better be in a negative Z scores. We are. So what we do is we want to find 0 0.2800 here. Because that percentile of 28th percentile would be expressed in this table as 0.2800. So 0 0.2800 is right between these two things, you see? Right here. Right between these two. So 0.289, I'm sorry, 0 0.2809 is here. And then 0.2776 is here. So it's in between these two numbers. So for this class, there's, there's a more formal way, it's called interpolation to get a specific number, but I don't really give a crap about that because this class is not about interpolating stuff and being so specific. This is about thinking. So we know the z-scores between these two. And let's go here. So it says negative 0.5, negative 0.58, and negative 0.59. So we have negative... 0.58 and negative 0.59. I'm okay if you take the midpoint. So negative 0.585. So hopefully, you know, you can trust me, add these two, I'll just do it. 0.58 plus 0.59. If you divide that by 2, oh. How come it doesn't work out like that? That's weird. 0.59, oh, plus. I must have did something wrong. Plus 0.58. If we divide this by 2, there we go. I think I divided it before. But what you want to do is you want to add those two together, 0.58 plus 0.59. Divide it by 2, you will get this number. I guarantee it. Also, if you're visual, it will make some sense. So negative 0.58, negative 0.59. The midpoint is right here, negative 0.585. So if you're visual, you can just think about the point in between here. Either way is fine. So this is our z-score. That's our z-score. 28% of the scores are below this z-score. How do we know? Because the table tells us. 0.280. 0.277, so it's in between here. 28th percentile, 28% of the scores are below the z-score right here. 
And let me go to my SNP. And let me remind myself of what it was, negative 0.585. So that thing from the table that we get just goes into our formula, negative 585. So negative 0.585. So remember, this is the only thing we have to go do something with, is we get this from the table. The mean and the standard deviation were given right here. So times 7. Don't forget your order of operations. So we have 55. That just waits. And it's going to be a negative number, so I'm just going to put negative right away. We have to multiply these two things first. So let's multiply. This is negative. I'm just going to keep it as positive because it doesn't really matter. Negative 0.585 times 7 is 4.10. You can round it up. 4.10. So 4.10. 4.10. That was the 0.585 times 7. Then you just solved it. And so I always keep on closing my calculator. So we have, oops, get over there. So we have 55 minus, because we had a percentile below 50, 4.10, 50.9. So with this distribution, a score at 50.9, 28% of people are below that. So this is the score at the 28th percentile. So you're given the mean, you're given the standard deviation. All you have to do is find 0 0.2800 on the table. Most of the time it will be between two numbers, so you just take the number that's in between. You plug that number in. You solve for the formula. That's the score. So that's not too bad of a process. I'm going to close that. I'm going to clear this. So I do believe that I have a solution for a percentile here, 95. So let's say that you have that mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. You want to find a score at the 95th percentile. If you want an extra example, go ahead and solve this. The answer is on the next slide. So the answer is here. You can pause on this. I'm not going to go over this. You can pause on that because there's an example here. This is maybe a little bit more complicated. So let's work through this one together. So we're going to use the same distribution. We're going to use the Wexler IQ test. It has a mean of 100, standard deviation of 15. It's right down here. Don't forget your formulas up here. So find the IQ score at the 36th percentile. Remember, you're already given the mean and standard deviation. All you have to do is find the Z at the 36th percentile. Go ahead and do that. OK, so let's solve this. I don't think I have the solution. No, I don't. So let's work through this, the 36th percentile. I am going to snip this. Ooh, okay, it's still there. Let's snip it. Our controls for recording are on the left, and so I got a little bit worried when it started doing something on the left hand side. So, 36 percentile, right? Our mean is 100, standard deviation 15. What's the score at the 36th percentile? So remember our, sorry about this. I'm going to have to redo this because apparently if I go off the edge, it starts blinking, which is really a pain in the butt. So let me just do this and make sure I don't go over the edge. So remember our formula is, oh, why is this doing this? This is really annoying. So. It's blinking over there. I think we're still recording. I think I'm going to close this. 
and I'm just going to reopen it. This may solve the issue. These things are so sensitive. Okay. So recall that we have a mean of 100. It's not blinking, so I was right. Mean of 100, standard deviation is 15. That's a one, 15. We want the score at the 36th percentile. That's what we're trying to find. Remember the formula is we're trying to solve for the score. And so if you remember the z-score, the next thing that's right next to the score that's really important is the mean. The mean's really important, so let's separate it. It says, I don't want to be around you other people. I'm so important. We have to separate it. And remember, the only two other things from the Z formula that are left are the Z score and the standard deviation. You may also remember this is that you're giving, and by the way, I want you to memorize this for the exams. You're given the bread. The bread's the mean and standard deviation. That's the bread. In the middle is the z-score. Just remember that you keep the, the mean separate. The only thing you have to do is you have to go to the table to find this one. So you go to the table to find this one. I'm not going to spell all the table, but you go to the table to find the z-score. That's all you do. And so we already know that the x will be Oops, this is the next. There's no mean there. X is mean 100. That's the mean. Standard deviation. What is this thing going on about? Standard deviation. Okay. We need to find the z-score. And standard deviation is 15. So we're given the bread 100, mean, standard deviation 15. All we have to do is find the z-score at the 36th percentile. This is not part of the formula. We're going to be looking in the table for the number of 0.3600. It's probably going to be between two numbers. We're in a negative z-scores, and that's where we need to be because the 36th percentile is below 50th percentile, so that's in a negative z-score, and you can see that it should be here. So we look, and I look right away, and I can kind of see right away that there's a 0 0.3631 here, and there's a 0 0.3594 here. So remember that we don't care about extrapolating to a specific number that is minutia that we don't need to worry about, just think conceptually. So the z-score is between these two. So I go way over here, and it looks like it's negative 0.3, negative 0.35, and negative 0.36. We have a negative 0.35, negative 0.36. If I think visually, it should be negative 0.355. I'm going to double check those numbers. 0.35, yep, and 0 0.36, 0 0.3631, 0 0.359. If you don't think visually, just plug in those numbers. 0.35 plus 0.36 divided by 2, you come up with the same number. Either way is fine with me, no big deal. So now we have the number to plug in, negative 0.355. That's the z-score where 36% of the scores are below, the 36th percentile. So negative 355. So our z is negative 355. So we're going to be subtracting these two numbers in a second. That's 0.355. And it's almost 1 o'clock. That's why I'm getting tired. 
and we have 15 here. Remember your order of operations, you have to take negative 355, so 100 is just waiting here, and it's going to be a negative number. Take 0.355, oof, 0.355 times 15, and I closed the calculator because I thought I was done with it for some silly reason. So right there it is, it's 0.355 times 15, so we have 5.325, correct? But I'm going to round it because we round things to the second decimal place, except for our proportions, which are four. So 5.33, round up. So we subtract this. We have 100 minus 533. We have 94.67. 94.67. So at this IQ score of 94.67, 36% of people are below it. Are below it. This score is at the 36th percentile. And that should make some sense. So remember, if you have a percentile below 50, your final number better be below the mean, and it is. It's below 100. If your percentile is above 50, your final number better be above the mean. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. This is pretty easy. So this is just finding this number on the table, plugging in the Z, from that number and then just cal calculating this. Multiply that by the standard deviation and then add or subtract that from the mean. Add it if the percentile is above 50. Subtract it if the percentile is below 50. And don't worry if you remember the sign of your z-score, it will come out automatically because if you add a, a negative number, it's a subtraction. That's all it's doing. So I think we're pretty close to finished with this lecture. So I think that we have a couple sort of conceptual slides, but that's most of the calculations. And I think while it might seem kind of a lot at first, I think if we just take it step by step, it's pretty easy. So why do we use standard scores? So standard scores are good because we could look at different things because once we standardize something, we know where you lie on the normal curve. We don't have to care about points anymore. So let's say that we have the same person right here. We have the same person, different test. So let's say somebody says, oh, I'm better, I'm better in history than I am in math. Uh, you can actually calculate this if you want, if you were some sort of statistics person. So they can take your history test they can take your points. They can find out what this class's mean and standard deviation was. You can convert their history exam to a z-score. Then you can take their math exam, and you can see how many points they got. You can convert those uh, points into a z-score once you know the mean and standard deviation for the class in the math test. So now you have two z-scores. Now you can just simply compare which z-score is the furthest down the right. Whichever z-scores furthest on the right is the one that you did better in. They can both be negative. So you might have a negative z-score of 1 in one class and a negative z-score of 0.9. The z-score of 0 0.9, negative 0 0.9, is closer to the mean, is furthest on the right. So whatever test that is, you did better on that relatively speaking. So you, we can make relative statements, and they don't have to be on the same scale. It doesn't have to be the same number of points or the same mean. We don't care about that. We just care about where you are in terms of standard deviations. That will tell us about percentiles. What percentile are you at that you're better than other people? Are you better than other people at math? Or are you better than other people in history? That's what that's telling us. 
we can also take two different persons and take two different tests. As long as there's not other things going on, like the tests are harder or something like that. But let's say that you have a friend in another stats class. And for some silly reason, you want to compare who's doing better. You don't necessarily have to have the same number of points and things like that, assuming the same difficulty between the two tests. So one test could be worth a two, 200 points, another test could be worth 150, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what the mean standard deviations are, you can tell what your percentile is by getting z-scores. So you can find out your friends points on an exam, you find out the mean and standard deviation for that class, for that exam, convert his points to, or her points to, a standard deviation, I'm sorry, to a z-score, express it in standard deviation units. You can take your points, look at our mean standard deviation, convert it to a z-score, express it in standard deviations. You can see which one of you did better than the other one which person had a z-score farther on the right, and therefore you had a higher percentile. You did better than most people on that test. So once we have z-scores, we can start comparing things that are measured on different scales because they're expressed in standard deviation units. And just remember this last little point on this slide is that raw scores are always meaningless. Whenever people say their points, like for example, their IQ points, I, I think, you say you have a high IQ, but you're running around talking about points. Points don't matter. What matters is where you are in terms of standard deviation. So your z-score matters, not that stuff, your points. So raw scores don't have a meaning. Z-scores, standard scores have meaning because we automatically know from a z-score or a standard score where you lie in the normal distribution. So whenever we have... Um, research, sometimes people convert their raw scores to standardized scores. So if they convert, they can convert everybody's score to a z-score. So if we take our first exam, I can take everybody's score in the first exam. I can convert everybody's score to a z-score if I wanted to. And what happens is if I have all those z-scores from the class, the whole distribution of z-scores, the mean of the z-scores is going to be zero. That's the average, remember? So the average is zero, and the standard deviation would be one. So sometimes people standardize everybody's score, and then that standardized distribution of scores will have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And they like to do that with tests like SATs, ACTs, even the IQ test, they do this. They standardize the scores so that they're easy to understand. And there's no big difference here. So the mean, if you have a mean of a 100 in a z-score transformation of the same distribution, notice the distribution doesn't change. If you convert all of these scores to z-scores, a z-score of zero is the mean. So 100 is the mean, the z-score for that is zero. And then let's say that there's a standard deviation of 10 in your normal distribution your regular raw scores, if you convert them to z-scores, your standard deviation now is 1. Again, notice here your distribution shape doesn't change. It's just that you've expressed these things into z-scores, into standard deviation units. And for this distribution of the z-scores, the mean is 0, standard deviation is 1, always. So a point here to remember is that even if you standardize the scores that you have in a distribution from a sample, let's say z-scores, but it doesn't matter, whichever standardized score is yours, you're not changing the shape of the distribution. There are some people, even people who have PhDs and who do try to publish stuff, who say that when you normalize and transform scores, you're making it into a normal distribution. You are not. You can see it here. You're just simply transforming things into z-scores. The distribution shape is exactly the same. You're not making this non-normal distribution into a normal distribution. You're not. You're not making it normal. You are just simply converting the scores into z-scores, into standard deviation units. So 
maybe if you want to embarrass some professors in the future, if you hear them say something like this, we normalize the score to make it into a normal distribution. You can show them what you know about stats. But then you might get them angry and then fail that class. So don't do that. I sort of mentioned this. This slide, don't memorize it. It's a little bit technical, but basically what they do is they, in standardized tests, they preset the scores that they want. So the SAT, they just don't take, they don't take your scores and then create numbers from it. What they do is they, we want this SAT to have a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So they use those mathematics to convert your scores using this force distribution. So again, you don't need to memorize this slide. Just know this conversion of scores into certain scores. You can do it with any sort of distribution. You can set a mean and standard deviation and have that forever. So SATs, they don't change their mean and standard deviation over the years because they force your scores, your points into this old distribution. Same thing for IQ. So when somebody might say, why, is, why doesn't IQ go up? Well, it shouldn't be going up because they're converting people into this distribution of a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. So don't worry about this slide too much. If you don't get the fine details, that's fine. I'm just talking about it because the book talks about it. This one you don't need to know because we've talked about it forever. So just to wrap up this topic, so we've done a lot of nitty gritty stuff here. After the exam, we'll get into more theoretical stuff, but basically we've seen that we've used the normal curve to find stable percents of scores. So every time that we have a solution, whether it's trying to find percentiles or proportions, or even to find a score at a percentile, we can always go to the Z score and figure out because the proportions under the curve, those are stable across every single normal curve. So what we're getting into, we're getting into a theory of inferential statistics. So let's say in inferential statistics, we want to say that we're 95% sure that our finding applies to the population. And if you don't get this, that's okay. But I feel compelled to kind of talk about this a little bit. This is a bridge to after the exam. So if you don't get this, don't worry, this stuff will not be on the exam, but I kind of want to talk about it. So remember, we know that we have this distribution, normal distribution. We know that the percents, whoa, sorry about that, my laptop again. We know that those percents are stable at any point. So we know that we can find percentiles, we can find proportions between scores. Those are all stable. So let's say that we do research and let's say that we just have two groups. Let's say we, we have drug research. And let's say that um, we have drug research and we think that this drug will improve people's emotions. So our, our thing here, our DV, our dependent variable, the thing that we're looking at is positive emotions. So positive emotionality, positive emotions. And this is low, and this is high on the scale. So we give a placebo. So one group, we have a placebo. It doesn't have the drug, but people think it might have the drug. So if there's something about, you know, having me an optimistic, oh, I'm taking this drug, it's supposed to work. We know what it is, but there's no drug there. Our placebo is probably here. Since there's no drug here, this is kind of like how people are, are on average in terms of their positive emotionality. So placebo kind of estimates the mean. There's no medicine in it, so it's just kind of average. If we think that our drug has an effect on positive emotionality, where should it be? Where should the mean for our drug group? So one group is the placebo group. We can see their mean on positive emotionality. So there'll be a mean for the placebo group, and it's going to be in the middle because it's probably going to be an estimation about people on average. How positive are they on average? And then we're going to have a drug group. So we're going to give our drug to people, 
And we're going to find the mean of positive emotionality for that group. So where should our mean be on the normal distribution if we're right? It better not be here because we thought that our drug would improve positive emotionality. If it's down here, below this mean of the placebo group, we're probably off. So we know that we want to be above this mean here. How far above the mean should we be? Well, I'll tell you in psychology and a lot of other social sciences, we want the mean to be way down here. In fact, we want the, the mean to be way down here so that 95% of the scores are down here. And then 5% are up here. Why is that? Well, if we're at the 95th percentile here, we're really far. We're far from this mean. We're way over here. In fact, it's so far that only there's only a 5% chance that our drug group would be so far high up here just by chance. So there's only a 5% chance that our drug group would be so much higher than the placebo group. This is good evidence that our drug works because there's only a 5% chance that's due to probability, which means there's a 95% chance this difference between the placebo and the drug group is due to the drug. We're 95% sure the drug works. This is the rest of the course. This is inferential statistics. So this is why those stable probabilities are important because we can actually find out whether that difference between those two means, the difference between the placebo and the drug group, is big enough to say that we're 95% sure that's due to the medicine. There's only a 5% chance due to probability that uh, that group came out so much higher than the other one. The drug group came out higher than the placebo. There's only a 5% chance of that, so that means that we're 95% sure the drug works. So this is the point of this whole standardized scores, is it's underlying the whole logic of inferential statistics. So again, if you didn't get that last part 100%, that's okay. We're going to talk about it a lot more throughout the semester. So what we just talked about when I just drew that stuff, this is the whole roots of inferential statistics. Inferential statistics, we take our samples data and we say, how sure, how probable is any finding that we found applicable to the population? So what I just drew was we're 95% sure it applies to the world, to everybody. 95% sure that this drug will work for you. There's a 5% chance that it's just random stuff. But 95% sure it's working. So I just drew that. So the drug treat if the drug mean is way far on the right, so far from the mean in the middle, from the placebo, then we can say, wow, they had a lot better positive emotionality. Therefore, it's very improbable, it's just due to chance. And therefore, our drug worked. At least we're 95% sure it works. So there will be a homework. There won't be an SPSS lab because all we did was stuff by hand. So there will be a homework. That homework will be a very important thing for you to study for the exam. So this is the last topic for the exam and I will post the study guide for the exam and I will post an audio review of the conceptual questions from the exam. The problem questions from the exam will review the stuff that we calculated in the lecture. So when we calculated, for example, means, median modes, standard deviations, variances, ranges, IQRs, and then doing the calculations here for the z-scores and finding the percentiles, finding proportions, and finding the score at a certain percentile. These are the types of things that will be on the problem aspects of the exam. That stuff will not be in the audio because that's sort of visual, but you'll have your homeworks and you will have the lectures that went through those problems as study material. And that should be it for this lecture. So I will talk to you later.